going to talk about the, the different ways you can do authorization in APIs. And one thing, Aldo, that you, you didn't really mention is um, why APIs in particular? It's because it's the lowest hanging fruit for authorization um, companies or frameworks to go after. But the truth is it applies to anything. You know, if you wanted to do authorization, or rather you need to do authorization for everything from APIs to microservices to COTS to SaaS to anything, right? So if we start with a simple picture, um, this is pretty much what you have. You have application code. You decide to expose an API to the outside world. And when I say the outside world, it doesn't have to be outside the company. It could very well be inside the company. And Katie, I don't know whether you ever do internal hacking, but I'm sure there's lots and lots to be hacked within a company without even going public. And um, generally, everyone has understood that you should not really build authentication inside of the app, but rather you should externalize authentication. Um, no one should dream of ever rewriting a database table that says username, password, and you know, a hash or, or a password in the clear, God forbid. So you use external identity providers like Curity, like um, um, the Microsoft products, AWS, so on and so forth. Cool. Um, one side question, though, is what, what is it we're authenticating? When I started with APIs way back when, authentication was really about the client talking to the API, not so much the end user identity. Here, when we deal with authorization, we're way more interested in the end user identity than we are the, the client identity. You've got to fix both, right? But the client is just the plumbing. What we care about in authorization, generally speaking, is the end user, the end person, the end entity. And I, I say user or person, but it could also be a process, a service, many different things. And then the next thing that happens is, um, of course, authentication has matured, and we came up with uh, OAuth and OpenID that solves a whole lot of things. So that's, I kind of put it as a separate layer, although it is part of authentication in a way and part of authorization as well. But it's so important, so fundamental in API authentication that I called it out. Now, there we go. OAuth was originally invented not for authorization. I know it stands for open authorization, but it was actually invented to avoid sharing passwords. And the typical use case is the following. You have a bank account with, Jonas mentioned Bank of America this morning, so I'll, I'll keep uh, using the same example. And you start using Mint to keep track of your spending at your bank and at your credit card company and your whatever. Well. Even today, I think Mint will literally ask you for your B of A password, which they shouldn't. They should use OAuth instead, right? So that's why OAuth was invented, to avoid you, the end user, having to share your password with a third party so they can connect on your behalf. So it's access delegation. It's not really authorization. Keep that in mind. Some of the things, and I stole this from Jonas's presentation, that uh, you can do with OAuth is define scopes, you can define claims, you can find tokens, all of which are really useful constructs to build an authorization strategy, but it's a very much what I'm going to call an identity-centric authorization approach. Okay? The problem with OAuth, and there's several problems with OAuth, um, is, for instance, when I wanted to share these, this presentation with, uh, with the organizers, um, I figured I was going to do it through, oh, I'm sorry, it was not with the organizers, it was with SlideShare. I wanted SlideShare to grab the, the presentation from my Google Drive instead of just downloading and uploading, because it sounded like the thing you'd do in 2024, and this is what it t asked me. Do you want FileStack to get access to your entire Google Drive files? Uh, no. And the thing is, they're probably doing the right thing, as in behind the scenes, they're probably only just getting access to that particular file, but do you really trust them, right? And Aldo, since you had you know, reading issues, I put in an Aldo animation for you. Um, sorry, that was a lot cheap. Um, some other things I want to dispel, but given the two other presentations we've had today and the presentations this morning, I think you all understand that authentication is not authorization, right? Authentication, oftentimes we think about, you know, I'm authenticating myself, I'm David, but the truth is authentication is proving something about yourself. It doesn't have to be your identity. So it could be, if you go drink, you have to be 21. Or if you live in Canada, like I do, you have to be 19, I think? I think it's 19. Um, OAuth is also not authorization. I already mentioned that. It's access delegation. OAuth can help you build some form of authorization through the use of scopes, through the use of claims, but it doesn't go far enough. And definitely, app code is not authorization. I mean, yes, you can do really fine-grained authorization within your app with app code, but then you end up with spaghetti code. You end up forgetting if statements, like you said, um, Katie, earlier. You end up having very poor visibility of what level of authorization you're doing within your app. You end up having very brittle systems that you 
have to update when a new uh, rule comes in. So API authorization, when it's homegrown, oh yeah, it's delicious and your developers are super happy, but it just doesn't scale well. So what we really want to do is, um, oh, I'm sorry, I did this slide this morning when I saw Bill's presentation. He had this amazing slide about API sprawl. Just replace the word API with authorization and you, you get the very same slide for me. What's the issue with baked in authorization? Well, it, it sort of seeps and creeps everywhere when you think of doing it, but you don't really know where you did it and how you did it, so you can't really trace it, you can't really audit it, you cannot prove compliance, and you forget things and you end up with uh, making Kitty very happy because she can find vulnerabilities. Woohoo! Um, so what you really want to do is, let's see if the animation works, is get rid of that code and add in a new layer for authorization specifically, which is where Aldo's presentation comes in and which is where my presentation comes in. You want to decouple and externalize authorization. Put it somewhere. You have security for um, authentication and you, you have many other products for identity management authentication. Just do the same thing for authorization. Even if it's a homegrown system, it's still better than baking it into the app. Why should I care? Both Aldo and Katie pointed to OWASP and Bill this morning as well. Um, there's actually two lists. There's the OWASP top 10. So the, the very first one here, um, A0 2021, is from the top 10, top 10 issues. And then the remainder of the bullets are from the API specific top 10 that came out in 2023. The first and second bullet are actually the exact same thing. Uh, you might have heard of BOLA, uh, so broken uh, object level access. And there's another name for it, IDOR, I think. Indirect, is IDOR? Yeah, same thing. I think we don't use IDOR anymore, right? Yeah. So these are the reasons why you want to do it. To make sure that Alice gets access to her own medical record and not Bob's medical record. I came up with this list of uh, 10 commandments that when you build an authorization solution or when you use an authorization framework, you should try to follow. Number one, you want your authorization to be declarative. You want to use some kind of configuration mechanism, a policy, a graph, um, uh, maybe uh, an advanced access control list, and we'll get into what those means later, but something that you can look at and understand what it represents. Something you can look at and share with the audit team, the compliance team. I visited a, um, a, uh, a bank, a large wealth, uh, wealth management bank out of New York, not to name them, there's a few, and they were interested in doing externalized authorization, it all made sense, and they literally told us today to prove compliance with whatever compliance they have to prove within a bank, we take a screenshot of the C code, they're doing C, and we share it with the compliance team. To which I asked, does the compliance team understand C? To which they said, no. But they still, that's how they still prove compliance with whatever rule. Instead, what you need is to have a, a configuration, a language, a policy that makes sense to everyone. The second thing is you want it to be dynamic, runtime. That's what you called um, uh, trust but verify, but you had another name for it, um, um, Aldo, I, I forgot what it was. Zero standing yes, the zero standing privilege. That's super fundamental. And one of the issues with OAuth is that you tend to have a relatively, relatively long-lived token that you carry with you and you can do whole lots of stuff with it, but actually you should be verifying every single time that whatever it is you're trying to do, you're allowed to do, right? So dynamic runtime authorization. That's the single biggest architectural change if you want to do authorization in products like a Salesforce. It's okay for APIs, because APIs, you hit them all the time, so there and then you can do authorization using Kong, using Zuplo, using API gateways, but for SaaS and COTS, it's way harder. You want it decoupled, I already mentioned that. Um, you want, I'm, I'm biased, I think ABAC is the way to go. Uh, there's different models, we'll get back to that, but ABAC is the whole idea that you can describe the user, the object, the resource, the context, the environment with labels, key value pairs. These are attributes, any number of attributes. There's no limit, sky's the limit. And you wanna use those in your configuration to determine whether access should be granted or denied. You could also do reback, which is a spin on ABAC, where in reback you're probably under the hood going to use a graph that is going to express the relationship between the user and the object. Um, the example that you had, Aldo, in your presentation was around a medical record. I'll show one about a, a bank account, but either way, there's an ownership relationship. That's what reback is. Um, it can be feature driven. Going back to the OWASP list, one of them was not access control specifically, it was business features access, which is pretty much the same thing, but on a business feature. One thing I tried to do many years ago, we're being recorded, I shouldn't say this. Um, never mind, I'll tell you later. Um, I was just trying to hack my way, but 
I don't do this for a living. Anyway, you want to be agnostic, right? It doesn't matter what authorization solution you, you use as long as you can swap it in, swap it out very quickly. So you want to be agnostic and, and not tied into any particular vendor. That's actually really important. You want to be future-proof. Pick an authorization framework that works today that will work tomorrow. Okay. You want to be scalable, of course. Um, maybe right now your API caters to 1,000 users and you have 1,000 authorization requests, but maybe you're going to open up to the entire whole world and have a million authorization requests. So think about something that will scale. The good news, though, the really good news for you API developers out there is that authorization is stateless, or more specifically, authorization is side effect free. And what I mean by that is if you ask an authorization service, can I do this? the act of asking the authorization service never, ever, ever changes the answer. It should never, by design. All authorization frameworks are going to tell you the same thing. If the question is, can I eat ice cream, and there's only the one ice cream, and you eventually do eat the ice cream, it's not the authorization service eating the ice cream. It's the application doing it. So it, you see how asking the question doesn't change the fact that there's ice cream to be had. What it means is you can have one authorization service or a thousand and you can route the request to any one of those authorization services. It won't change the behavior. So it scales extremely well. And then the last thing is transparent audit and review because I'm a little cynical, but at the end of the day, we do security for two reasons. Number one, because we care about our users, but number two, more importantly, because we don't want to get our fingers slapped on by compliance teams. And so being able to, being able to prove compliance is really, really fundamental. Authorization models, this is a slide I stole verbatim from one of Jonas's presentations from last year, I think. Um, there are many different authorization models, but roughly speaking, you have access control lists. They've been around forever. It's the simplest thing you could put in place. The, um, the reason I have them on this side is because Google came up with a model called Zendibar, I want to say five, seven years ago, um, give or take, that um, Signal then, then also took up and, and built into a really pretty um, good authorization model. You have RBAC, role-based access control, of course, been around since 1992, formalized by NIST, if you're interested in, in seeing the, the proper definition. Um, the challenge with both ACL and RBAC is they tend to be identity-centric, so you only cater to half the authorization equation. And that's where RBAC, relationship-based access control, and ABAC, attribute-based access control, come in because they're going to be looking at not only the user, but also the resources you're trying to get access to, the bank account, the medical records, so on and so forth, contextual data, time of day, location, so on and so forth. So when you do decide to externalize your authorization, which you should, I know you're all going to walk out there and do, that's the first thing I'm doing tomorrow morning. Thank you. Uh, here are the different um, options. So the, the very first one, the one I'm, that I'm biased towards, is ABAC and policy-driven authorization. You'll find standards like ZACML, it's been around forever, 2001, and Alpha. So I work for Axiomatics. This is what we do. Um, Alpha is, is the, the newer version of the language. You have CEDAR that came out last year by AWS, um, another way of, of doing policies. You have, of course, Open Policy Agents. It's been around since 2015. It is um, biased toward, that's not true, I've got six minutes left. Um, you have open policy agents, so what's interesting with the OPA is that you'll read everywhere that it's for Kubernetes, but it's actually not true. I mean, yes, it's true, but you can also use it for anything. It's just a policy language. It works really well. Um, I'll, I will add that in terms of languages, Rego and OPA is the richest, most complete, biggest, but not the best. And what I mean by that is, because it's a complete programming language, you can do everything under the sun, but sometimes you just don't want to do everything under the sun. Um, Cedar and Alpha, by design, they're very constrained. You cannot do everything, but they're easier to audit and prove compliance and so on and so forth. Uh, the second approach is RBAC, uh, graph-based authorization companies like Three Edges, companies like Asserto and Topaz, they're open source alternative. Uh, OpenFGA, BiAlf0, and Okta is also another graph-based way of doing um, authorization. And then you have access control lists, companies like Signal. Um, I think OpenFGA also uses Enzibar behind the, behind the scenes, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so there's lots and lots and lots to, of things to, to choose from. And they're all good alternatives. They have pros, they have cons. Just try them out. Come talk to us, Aldo and me, and we can, we can guide you. We're better. Um, I'm just kidding, Aldo. 
Some of the use cases that we have, so binary authorization requests, can Alice view account one, two, three? Um, in alpha land, you get four possible answers, but forget the last two ones, you really just get either yes or no, that's what also Aldo showed. Um, you can also do batch authorization requests. If you're thinking about authorization from a scale perspective, you wanna know, you know which records a person can do, you can also do that. Um, there is actually, I mentioned that in the following slide, there's um, um, an open API spec for what that looks like. Um, so if we broke it down, this is what a plain old English requirement would look like. Managers can view their customer's accounts, so a customer can view their own account. And what you want to do is highlight the key words in there, so the role or the title or the, the purpose of the user. You want to highlight the action that they want to do. You want to highlight the object that they want to get access to. Bank account, medical record, same story. This is what the policy would look like if you use alpha as the language. Different policies, slightly different syntaxes, but pretty much the same thing. So here, I have a policy that specifies that we're dealing with an account, then I'm doing the action view. Um, do I have a, ooh, perfect, so account view, and then here I have a manager policy and a customer policy that I'm gonna, uh, that I have here. So the manager policy looks at the role, and then here I have a relationship where I'm checking that the username is in the list of assigned reps. And same story for the, for the uh, ownership of the account. Here I'm doing that relationship check, which is what you had, Aldo, as well in, in your uh, presentation. If you want to see the interface, um, this is the link to uh, the um, uh, open API spec. This is a Postman collection that you guys can play with. I promise it's not a piece of software that I put there to hack your phones. Um, here's what it looks like in um, Zachwell JSON. So it's a set of key value attributes. This is what the response looks like. Now, what's interesting with APIs and API gateways is that you can actually do authorization on the way in as you're about to use the API. So can I view bank account one, two, three? But you can also do authorization on the way out. That's not really because of the authorization framework. That's just a feature of APIs and API gateways. And that's quite cool. Because if I'm saying, can I view account one, two, three? And the answer is yes, and I'll get the payload back. Maybe I want to mask the um, account number or maybe I want to mask the last five transactions and just show the balance. So that's stuff that you could do on the way out. Um, so you could use Kong, you could use Zuplo, you could use any number of API gateways. There are, I have three minutes left, Jonas. Um, and I'm gonna use my time, but I'm almost done. Um, some of the benefits, I'll, I'll skip over this. This is my uh, marketing team slide, um, if you wanna take a picture. It applies to any of the, uh, any of the uh, authorization vendors, really. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is there is a new effort under the OpenID Foundation called AuthZen. AuthZen is about standardizing what can be standardized within the authorization community, namely the request response scheme. The JSON I showed you comes from um, ZACMOL, so it's the ZACMOL way of doing authorization. Uh, but Signals API is only slightly different, and if you look at another vendor, it's only ever slightly different. If you look at Rigo, so on and so forth. So we said in AuthZen, well, let's just standardize this. And I think we have every, every major player, open source and vendor involved in all the Zen so that we can come up with a standard interface so that it makes integration easier. A few other efforts happening. Um, there's GeneApp, which is around authorization based on OAuth. There's rich authorization requests that I think Curity you support within the product that is a predefined way of calling out to an authorization service from within the identity server. Um, then there's Alpha as well that I already mentioned. And then a bunch of other articles um, that uh, I just added for your own reference. And I think that is it. With one minute and 45 seconds to spare.